Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to speak here at the Spencer Award. I'm delighted to be in Kansas City. It was uh, uh, beyond my expectations. I expected to see a quiet, uh, dusty mid Midwest town, but I was surprised that it's so clean and actually very, very modern and, uh, and actually more modern than where I come from in the San Francisco Bay Area. So it was a big surprise. No cows in the road. No cows in Actually, I, I live uh, next to a cows. <laughs> uh, so I'm here because I nominated Bruce uh, for the uh, Spencer Award and wanted to talk a little bit our, about our history. Uh, uh, the reason I work for the USDA is that before I joined the USDA, I used to work for a, a company called ConAgra. It's a major food company, and, and uh, they had a laboratory in, in Southern California. And uh, they were under the misconception that I was a food scientist because I worked for a food company. But, but actually, when I joined ConAgra, I, I had no training in food science or nutrition uh, because the company already had uh, uh, a whole team of food scientists, but they had some problems that uh, they were not able to solve. And so they thought that, well, you know, maybe we need to hire a chemist or somebody who knew something about uh, 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 theory of, 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 uh, of foods. And so they hired me because I had a degree in, in biophysical chemistry, uh, but I didn't know anything about foods. So uh, because I didn't know anything about foods, uh, when I joined the USDA, uh, the, there were three people who were actually trained as nutritionists. But uh, before I got there, one of them had died. The, the, the second person got promoted to his job, and, uh, and that was about two years before I got there. And by the time I got there, she was promoted to center director. And then the next person got promoted to, to his job. And so there was really nobody who was a, a bench scientist who was doing, who knew anything about nutrition. So. Uh, actually, our laboratory is only two miles from UC Berkeley, but um, and I thought for sure when I said I needed to, you know, to work with some nutritionists that they would send me to Berkeley. But uh, you know, Berkeley is a hotbed of activism, including uh, animal rights uh, activism, and we do animal studies. And so, being the USDA and, the, and being the government, we don't actually have to register our facility because you know we're in charge of them. So not many people knew that uh, we had an animal lab laboratory. So anyway, so that's how I got to Berkeley and then somebody had recommended Bruce and uh, also the, uh, the chair of the uh, nutrition department at that time. So, so that was my uh, uh, first acquaintance with Bruce. And at that time, Bruce was in his early 30s. He had some young children and I remember uh, having a meeting with him at uh, six o'clock in the evening. And uh, his wife came in, this very tolerant woman, glared at me <laughs> because here, here, here he was at six o'clock in the evening again, you know, uh, having some kind of meeting instead of being home. Uh, so those were the early days. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we, uh, so you, you recall I didn't know anything about nutrition, so I, uh, uh, but I worked in a, in a, in a cereals lab, and um, before Kansas and the, and the Midwest became the big wheat growing in the uh, uh, area of the U.S., actually California was a big wheat growing area because the, the Spanish missionaries had to feed Spanish settlers, and so they had planted wheat around the missions that ran up the coast of California. But uh, after the uh, uh, discovery of these hard wet wheats that grew well in Kansas and uh, newer milling methods, Kansas became the, uh, the big uh, wheat growing area. But, uh, but the Albany lab actually still does uh, most of the wheat genetic work and, uh, and the uh, cereal genetics work for the USDA. So there's a tremendous amount of wheat research actually done in Albany. And so because of that, uh, we still did cereal research and so we were interested at that time in things like beta-glucans. So beta-glucan is a sticky fiber in oatmeal that lowers heart disease, or lowers cholesterol, prevents heart disease. So we were, so we were interested in dietary fiber. And, uh, and Bruce and his laboratory was interested in things like fish oils uh, because fish oils can be converted into these uh, uh, 
uh, interleukins, these anti-inflammatory and inflammatory agents, um, which was you know, really remarkable considering this was 30 years ago and most people are thinking of fat as calories and, um, and uh, not thinking about uh, these inflammatory properties of, 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 of fats, which, uh, which is now almost everything, and everything is inflammation these days. Uh, the other thing they were interested in was the fact that we used a hamster as a, as a model for, uh, uh, for our cholesterol research. And the reason is that uh, the, the hamster uh, has a, yeah, the male hamster has a very low rate of uh, cholesterol synthesis in the liver. And what we like to do when we do this type of research is like, we like to boost the level of blood cholesterol. And we do that by feeding a small amount of cholesterol. But what happens with the animal, say like a rat, the rat produces a lot of cholesterol in the liver. And when you add cholesterol in the diet, liver cholesterol synthesis goes down. So it's hard to raise the blood cholesterol because now the liver synthesis is, is, has decreased a lot. But the hamster had very low cholesterol synthesis in the liver to begin with. So when you feed cholesterol, it's easy to boost the uh, uh, cholesterol uh, in hamsters. Uh, the other thing was uh, the hamster has the identical bile acids as humans. You know, mice have um, some unusual bile acids, and so, but uh, the hamsters have identical ones, the lysocholic acid and uh, chenodeoxycholic acid. And I think it's very, very important because uh, uh, it's been discovered that bile acids uh, not only are the products of cholesterol metabolism, but they themselves are, recept are, are ligands for a lot of what's called nuclear re receptors that uh, affect uh, fat, uh, energy metabolism, and sterile metabolism. Uh, there are some other properties, uh, including uh, what I think is interesting is body temperature, that the hamsters have the ex exact same body temperature as humans, 98.6. So sometimes I think the, uh, the hamster has evolved from, or the humans have evolved from hamsters. <laughs> so okay. so um, one of my contributions to our, our research was that uh, because we use small animals for uh, 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 cholesterol metabolism research, uh, at that time, uh, most people used the ultracentrifuge to separate VLDL, LDL, and HDL, which required a, a fair amount of sample. And in a mouse, you're lucky to get a half a mil of plasma. With a hamster, you can get a few mils of plasma. Uh, but if you uh, uh, use an ultracentrifuge, you might have to pool two or three more animals to get to, to do one sample, so it requires a lot more animals. But at that time, there was a publication about using size exclusion chromatography. Uh, so uh, we um, use a size exclusion column, which is just a glass column filled with these little uh, uh, carbohydrate beads, and the beads have s small holes in the pores. Uh, it's like a sponge. And, and the, uh, the big particles, like VLDL cannot get into this into these spongy holes, and so they pass right through as as the uh, as the uh, solvent flows through the column. Smaller particles are able to get into the holes, but they don't stay there very long. So they spend more time in the in the holes, and they come out after the large particles. And the really small particles like HDL uh, stay in the in the holes much longer, so they come out last. And then they go through this uh, laser detector, and it turns out that small particles don't scatter light in a, in a wide an angle as large particles. So large particles will scatter light in a, in, a, in a wide range. And so by measuring the scattering angle, you can measure the amount of large particles, small particles, medium particles, and know how much HDL, LDL, and VLDL. Only requires about 10 to 15 microliters of plasma you know, versus uh, uh, you know, three mils. So it saves you a lot of animals. You don't have to use as many animals, and it's much more accurate. And in fact, um, you know, Bruce wanted to see, really, is this really, really accurate? So he took a blood sample like every other day for like 10 days, and we analyzed it, and it was like one lay right over the other. It's just amazing, you know. Whereas if you did it by ultracentrifuge, you would get a lot more variability because it was so much te technique driven. So we did this, you know, over 20 years ago, and we're still using this method. But 
So one of the things that we studied, uh, uh, I was, like I was saying, was uh, oat beta-glucans. But beta-glucans are very unstable because in the cereal itself, there are enzymes that will break it down. So if you buy something like Quaker Oats, they have to heat stabilize it uh, before they can sell it. Otherwise, the, uh, the beta-glucans would have been broken down. So um, after we're working with beta-glucans or oat beta-glucans and barley beta-glucans for five or six years uh, and, and having to be so careful and not knowing uh, what you were getting. And after we got the, the light scattering detector, we realized that a lot of the work that we were doing, uh, uh, we really didn't know what was happening. And we found that there was a lot of uh, degradation of the beta glucans. So you don't want to do these studies where uh, you don't know what you're feeding. And so we found this molecule it's called HPMC, hydroxypropyl methylcellulose. It's made by Dow Chemical. It's, it's, it's widely used in foods and other uh, consumer products. Just a small amount of it, a tenth of a percent, thickens things. So you can have thicker milkshakes or thicker shampoos uh, uh, by adding this compound. Um, and you were talking about maltodextrins. So maltodextrins are also made by, up of uh, glucose units. And these uh, uh, cellulose molecules are made up of about maybe 10,000 glucose units. So they are very, very long polymers and, uh, and very viscous. Uh, and, uh, and Dow Chemical knew that ingested uh, methylcellulose uh, is not retained by the body. And they knew that by labeling them with uh, radioactive carbon. Uh, but they didn't know whether the molecule itself was intact. And so by using this uh, uh, size exclusion method, what we did was we fed rats this methylcellulose in their diet. And first, we measured the molecular weight of the methylcellulose in the diet, which is this dark line here, this here, and this here. So there's three lines where we did the sampling from the diet three times. And there are 10 other light lines where we sample from the feces. And you can see that there's, a, on the average, a s small decrease in the molecular weight. So, uh, so in the diet, it's maybe about uh, 200,000 molecular weight, and then the, uh, in the feces, maybe um, uh, 170,000 molecular weight. And there's this really, really simple formula. 